Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. A 15-year-old suspect is in custody today in Raleigh, North Carolina. Police believe the suspect killed five and wounded two others in a shooting. In the White House response, President Biden called for stricter gun laws. Another intense school board meeting in Michigan. Yesterday, the board resumed a meeting that was cut short on Monday after protests got too loud. Pushback against the move towards more gender transition surgeries for minors. We hear what Representative Diana Harshberger says. A 15-year-old white juvenile suspect is in custody today after five people were killed yesterday in a shooting in Raleigh, North Carolina. Officials offered few details about what happened in the quiet, middle-class neighborhood, but reported that one of the victims was off-duty police officer Gabriel Torres, age 29. At least two others were wounded, including another police officer. The suspect's shooting spree covered two miles of streets and a popular greenway. After a long standoff, the suspect was critically injured. During the rampage, the suspect reportedly wore camouflage and carried a camouflage backpack. President Biden said in a statement Friday, we must pass an assault weapons ban. Governor Roy Cooper, a Democrat, called it an infuriating and tragic act of gun violence. And an update to a story we reported on last night. In Michigan, a school board meeting about sexually explicit books ended early on Monday after attendees were told they had to leave the room. Yesterday, the meeting continued, this time with even more attendees than before. Members of the Dearborn School Board in Michigan are in an ongoing debate with locals about books that many parents consider to be too sexually explicit for kids. Some members of this board have inclined towards an insane, liberal LGBT ideology that holds many fanatical views, but none so deranged as the idea that pornography is good and students should have access to pornographic material in school as part of education. The board and parents met on Monday, but that meeting ended early. Attendees were told to leave because the number of people in the room violated the fire code. Parents later erupted in a chant to vote them out against the board members. Vote them out! Vote them out! On Thursday, the meeting resumed at a larger location with even more attendees. Some speakers said they thought it was obvious that many of the parents were anti-LGBT. Let's talk about what this really is. You hate gay people, and it's obvious, because look at how you behave when one gay person speaks. Look at how you act. But others responded that the protest was not about the LGBT community. To the LGBT community, the majority of parents are not here to attack your right to exist in a free society. Political figures also attended. Christina Caramo is the Republican candidate for Michigan Secretary of State and is endorsed by former President Trump. I think it is absolutely unacceptable for people in education to think that they know what's best for somebody else's child. God gave me my child, not the school district. Candidate for Michigan Attorney General Matt DiPerno, who's also being endorsed by Trump, cited a Michigan law regarding parents' rights in education. It is the natural, fundamental right of parents and legal guardians to determine and direct the care, teaching, and education of their children. Fundamental right of the parent. The school board has reportedly removed the books in question for review, but it's not yet clear whether they'll be returned to the shelves. Reporting by Arian Pastar, NTD News. More and more public venues are hosting drag shows for children. Are the shows appropriate for kids? A former drag queen spoke with NTD. As a young teen, I felt I should be a woman. For 20 years, Kevin Witt dressed as a woman, wore makeup, and performed as a drag queen. But after picking up a Bible eight years ago, Witt changed his mind. He warns parents that drag shows are targeting children for grooming. I really think that there is a group of drag queens that they have now that who are being trained specifically to groom children. Witt describes his life as a drag queen, a life he says was not appropriate for children. I was not just a drag queen. I was a transsexual. I was a prostitute. 
So I prostituted and I worked in the sex industry as a trans woman. And I did everything from doing, I was an escort. I did, I was a phone sex operator. I did webcam modeling. I did porn photo shoots. My mentality that I lived in was not appropriate for children. The type of person I was, was not even my humor, my conversations, all of this was not appropriate for children. Witt says his experience wasn't unusual among drag queens. A lot of drag queens were drug dealers. We have found drag queens who were registered sex offenders who were performing for children. You wouldn't have a um, porn star come and do a porn show for your children or a stripper come and do a strip show for your kids. So why would you have a drag queen? Witt says the rise of drag shows comes from communist ideology and is working to destroy families. He refers to a list of 45 goals of the Communist Party in the U.S. laid out in the 1958 book The Naked Communist. One reads, present homosexuality, degeneracy, and promiscuity as normal, natural, and healthy. It's all a strategy to tear down the nuclear family. Then they can take over everything. Today, Witt works at Culture Warriors of America, an organization with a mission to expose child sex groomers and their enablers. Reporting by Angela Moy, NTD News. And in Tennessee, Vanderbilt University Medical Center's pediatric transgender clinic last week announced it's pausing surgeries on minors. That's after 62 state representatives wrote a letter to the clinic asking it to stop performing the procedures. It also follows the Daily Wire's reports showing a doctor at the clinic discussing how profitable transgender surgeries can be for the hospital. Now, federal lawmakers are proposing legislation to prevent these transgender surgeries on children. One of those is U.S. Congresswoman Diana Harshbarger, who represents Tennessee. I spoke with her earlier today. Representative Diana Harshbarger, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, it's my pleasure, Stephanie, anytime. Now, after much pushback, Vanderbilt University Medical Center has paused transgender surgeries on minors. You, along with over 60 other lawmakers, sent a letter to the Medical Center's board imploring them to stop. What's your reaction to the pause? Well, the letters worked. You know, there's enough outrage from parents and from healthcare professionals to say, wait a minute. You know, in some of the uh, research and documentation we uncovered, there was gender affirming care given to children as young as six years old. You know, I'm a grandmother, for heaven's sake, Stephanie, of five and seven year old so grandsons. And listen, I think it's an abomination for someone to come in and ask those children, do you really think you're a boy? Do you really think you're a girl? It, it's hard enough for them to decide which shorts to wear to school that day or what to pack in their lunch. Are you kidding me? This is, uh, it's going beyond what the parameters. And, and one thing for sure, pediatrics, transgender clinic, those two words are pediatric transgender. They shouldn't even be used in the same sentence, dear, ever. The medical center said that it does require parental consent before they administer transgender drugs and surgery on minors. Do you think that parental consent changes the ethicality of that procedure? Well, uh, you know, the parent should always be involved in any type of health care. You know, what's happening is we're getting mixed messages, not only to the students or the children, but to the parents as well. What loving parent would want to take care and do the best for their children if there's questions, but give them the truth, give them the facts and let them make that decision. Uh, and, and don't leave it up to people who are intentionally grooming our children. That's, that's, that's not where it should be. You're one of several lawmakers proposing a new bill, the Protect Children's Innocence Act. Could you break it down for us? What would it do? Well, it would protect these children. You know, what's happening, they're being indoctrinated in the school systems, especially, you know, starting at middle school. It's kind of like what uh, Governor DeSantis tried to do in Florida and did do with the bill saying, hey, they need to be in third grade before you even talk about sex education. What's happening is these children are exposed to things at the ages of five, six, and seven that they should never be exposed to. And that's where protecting our children's innocence comes in. You know, 
there's just a lot that we need to discuss, and we're doing that at a federal level. Now, Governor Gavin Newsom recently signed a bill into law that allows California courts to strip custody from parents who dispute transgender procedures for their child. And this doesn't only apply to California residents, but to any parent in the U.S. if their child enters the state of California. So how do you see the battle between the states and federal government playing out here? Well, it's going to be the most stringent law, and it's an abomination for that man to try to take their parental rights away when they disagree with how to raise their children. It's really pathetic in my eyes, and um, I hope that we can do something in Washington that will put a stop to some of this crazy thinking. Is there anything that you think our viewers still need to know about this situation, about this case, and about transgender surgeries on minors in general? Yeah, um, you know, this indoctrination or this grooming is taking place in our school systems. And parents need to get involved at every level of education. They need to be at every school board meeting. They need to make their voices heard. We can do that in Washington. They can do it at a state level. But you better be there at a local level. And don't think that because even in my district in East Tennessee, we have a lot of rural area here. Don't think it can't creep in because it already has. And you have to be that voice to say, no, you're not going to do that to our children. And as a woman in Congress, and there's more women coming to Congress on the Republican side, you want to get people riled up in this country, go ahead and tell a mother they can't do something. Go ahead and take, tell a grandmother like me that, no, you're, you're not going to have a say-so. That is absolutely wrong and we're here to uh, back up the parents and say, just get involved, know what they're teaching your children and know how to react when there's something you don't agree with. All right, thank you so much, Representative Diana Harshbarger. Thank you for your time. My pleasure, Stephanie. Next, the latest on former President Trump's legal battles. The Justice Department today officially appealed the appointment of the special master who's overseeing the review of documents seized at Mar-a-Lago. The department argued that Judge Eileen Cannon had no authority to interfere with their federal criminal investigation. It's asking a federal appeals court to invalidate Cannon's order and end the special master's review of documents. And earlier today, Trump denounced the January 6th committee after it voted unanimously to subpoena him. He wrote in a letter to the chairman saying... That committee is ignoring why so many people came to the Capitol in the first place, which was a belief that the election was a fraud. He also wrote that he called for putting the National Guard in place much sooner, but it was rejected. The subpoena is unlikely to succeed, since it will likely prompt legal challenges from Trump's attorneys. Also today, a judge tossed out one of the five counts and a charge against a key source for the Steele dossier. The document that included numerous allegations about Trump that have since been discredited. Jurors will decide on the other four counts of lying to the FBI. And the Biden administration's first formal defense strategy, released this week, says this is a decisive decade for America and the world, a decade in which the terms of geopolitical competition between the major powers will be set. The strategy lays out three key ways the White House plans to ensure a free world. Investing at home, building coalitions, and modernizing the U.S. military. Earlier today, I spoke with Andrew Thornbrook, a defense reporter covering China at the Epic Times. He also holds a master's degree in military history from Norwich University, the nation's oldest private military academy. Andrew Thornbrook, welcome to our show. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Now, the Biden administration's first formal national security strategy points to China as America's most consequential geopolitical challenge. But just last week, President Biden warned of a potential nuclear Armageddon in relation to Russia. So what makes China the bigger threat here? Yeah, well, I think the administration understands that China really presents a global threat, which it outlines in its strategy, whereas Russia presents an acute threat, particularly in regards to the war of conquest ongoing in Ukraine, Putin's threats of nuclear war. But China really is the long-term threat. It's the pacing challenge, and it challenges us. The Chinese Communist Party challenges us on all fronts, economic, military, security, everywhere in the world, whether it's in the Arctic, the Indo-Pacific, or here on the home front. 
And based on your expertise, what do you think our viewers should know about this national security strategy? Yeah, I think it's a good start, but it's not enough. We need to really focus on breaking apart Russia and China, which we have not done in any serious way. Every single action we've taken against Russia and Ukraine and every single action we've taken against the CCP in trying to deter a conflict with Taiwan has pushed them closer together. And the more we push them closer together, the harder it's going to be for us, particularly in emerging contested domains like the Arctic. Uh, so currently, for example, the Arctic is such a big threat right now, or it could present present such a big threat because all traditional ballistic missiles fired at the United States homeland from Russia or China would need to pass over the Arctic. And so as we see this increased cooperation, we need to be worried about fighting a war on multiple fronts, which we simply have never had to do at this scale. Recognizing these challenges, how do you think the administration should proceed going forward with this strategy? Yeah, so the best thing the administration could do right now is try to seriously curb the CCP's influence abroad and really meet it toe-to-toe toe -to -toe in, term, in the diplomatic game. Uh, the CCP at present cannot fight a total war against, the United, a, a war against the United States of the type that we would expect over Taiwan, uh, though they might try something smaller, more regional. Uh, but ultimately, the future of the world and whether or not a huge conflict emerges between our powers will come down to how well we challenge the CCP for influence. It is an influence game at this point. We see this in the UN time and time again with abstention votes, uh, particularly in support of Russia, for instance. Uh, you know, if China ever weighed in against Russia, it would be a, a deal breaker. Or if Russia ever weighed in against China, but we've pushed these two powers together and we need to work on showing the nations of the world that the United States is the best bet for the future that will be more free, more prosperous if we continue with the international rules-based order rather than giving in to authoritarianism such as the type that the CCP promotes. And in a broad sense, what do you think of the strategies laid out to achieve that influence? I think that we're on the right track. We're, we're reorienting towards really trying to invest in our partners and our allies in the Indo-Pacific and elsewhere. We understand that we can't do this without them. Our military is simply not big enough, though it is more advanced. Our nation is simply not big enough to fight China and Russia at the same time. Economically, it would be a war of global catastrophe that we're not prepared to fight in that many fronts without our allies. And so in, com in terms of deterring conflict or even waging conflict, we need our allies, we need more partners, and we need to pull back the CCP and Russia from the brink. Uh, this strategy, it, it's a good start towards that end. Andrew Thornbrook, defense reporter covering China at the Epoch Times. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Coming up, a recent concussion in the NFL led to widespread outcry and a change in medical protocols. But should it have been treated better anyway? NTD's Dave Martin speaks with a university team doctor. That and more after this short break. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and my employees and I want to thank each and every one of you for your continued support. With everything going on right now, your rest is so important. That's why we're having the biggest My Pillow sale ever. Not only are my bed pillows as low as $19.98, but you can get the best body pillows ever. Regular $89.98, now only $29.98. Take your rest on the go with our Roll and Go Anywhere My Pillows for only $14.98. And we have our new couch and accent pillows. They aren't just for looks. They have My Pillows patented adjustable fill that gives you that amazing My Pillow comfort. In this economy, you get the best gifts ever for the best prices ever. So go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen, use your promo code and you get deep discounts on body, couch, bolster pillows, and so much more, including my original bed pillows for as low as $19.98. Please order now while quantities last. In international news, British Finance Minister Kwasi Kwarteng has confirmed in a tweet today that he resigned 
after Prime Minister Liz Truss asked him to stand aside from the position. It comes after weeks of political and economic drama surrounding the tax-cutting mini-budget last month. His termination means he was on the job for 38 days, making him the second shortest serving UK Chancellor on record. Member of Parliament Jeremy Hunt was appointed as the new finance minister. Hunt was a prominent backer of Truss's rival Rishi Sunak in the Conservative leadership race. And now over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. The NFL has changed its concussion protocol in response to the debate surrounding Miami quarterback Tua Tungavaloa, who was injured in a game against Buffalo on September 25th. The hit left him visibly disoriented, but he was allowed to re-enter the game after passing the NFL's concussion protocol. I was really stunned that he was back in the game. John J. Letty has been a team doctor at the University of Buffalo for more than 25 years and together with a colleague developed his own concussion program. He says concussions are one of the most difficult injuries to diagnose, but this one shouldn't have been that way. In his case, had you just looked at the video of the uh, play at the end of the Bills uh, uh, first half, uh, it shouldn't have been that hard. Um, I mean, I thought he was concussed. I do this for a living. I had friends texting me saying, why is he back in the game? And they're not medical people. Tonga Valoa, though, for his part, said it was his back which was injured earlier in the game that caused him to stumble. I've never seen a back injury behave like that. Not once. Um, and I talked to other team doctors who take care of professional sports. Neither have they. The NFL and the Players Association said that while the protocol was followed, it wasn't effective. As a result, they have added abnormal balance, motor coordination, or speech, also known as ataxia, to the list of symptoms that prevent a player from re-entering the game. Frankly, his, the medical staff should have protected his brain by keeping him out of the second half of that game. Whether he said he was fine or not, and whether he passed the subsequent tests or not, and it looks like he did. But like I said before, I've seen athletes do that, especially elite athletes. It uh, doesn't mean they're not concussed. They are. Uh, it's just that they are very, very different physiologically than you or me, and they can sort of, through muscle memory and motor control and, and their eliteness, uh, you know, function pretty well for a while uh, with a head injury, although it generally does catch up to them. Tonga Valoa has returned to practice, but has been ruled out for Sunday's game against the Vikings. And tonight in sports, the third game of baseball's triple header today is Game 3 of the Dodgers-Padres series, which is tied at one game apiece. Tony Gonsolin starts for the Dodgers, while the Padres will have Blake Snell on the mound. That's all for your sports news today. Back to you, Steph. Thanks, Dave. Now to online shopping. Most everyone seems to be buying their products this way now, but those next day deliveries require a lot of land for warehouses, and that means someone else is giving up theirs. NTD's Jackie Rios went to hear both sides of the story. With almost everyone shopping online now and wanting their packages delivered as soon as possible, that costs for a lot of warehouse space, but that takes up land, and in this case, farmland. We talked to several farmers in Ontario to hear what they think. One of those farmers is Pedro Rojo Tavares. He owns Rojo Farms in Southern California, San Bernardino County, where he's worked the land for close to 20 years and watched all the changes. I'm Fullington, look at Fullington. What's Fullerton in Anaheim? We used to work on the fields there. Right now, I believe there aren't places over there to harvest because now it's only warehouses and factories. So we all moved over here, but now they're doing the same thing. So they're pushing us to places where the land is no good to grow any produce. But on the other side, massive fulfillment centers are being built simply to meet consumer demand. That's especially so when serving the roughly 18 and a half million people in the greater Los Angeles area. So we go to where the customer demand is, right? So our fulfillment centers and our delivery stations are located where we have the most demand. Eileen Hartz gave a tour of one of the facilities in the neighboring city of Eastvale. So we have about a little over 3,000 employees here and the building's a little bit over a million square feet. Yes, a lot of people that get off from work come and buy everything fresh that they see, they take. So that benefits us, the farmer, that there are a lot of warehouses, so more people stop by and they end up buying. 
Though Isarara said more people in the area means more customers to shop at his stand, he's realistic about land being limited. No, there's less land, and it's being used for warehouses, houses, stores, and agriculture is almost done here. More and more of the land is being depleted. They are constructing a lot. We'll see how the landscape changes in the future, along with people's buying needs. Jackie Rios, NTD News, California. And that's all for today's news. Thanks so much for joining in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Only keeps selective videos on its platform. So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.